Welcome to another week of the Recruitment Flex. I'm Serge, joined again by my lovely, beautiful co-host, Shelly. How's it going, Shelly? Oh my God. What, have you turned over a new leaf or something, Serge? You're so sweet to me lately. Oh my God. I know. Goodness. It is my resolution. Sugar. It is put sugar in your coffee. There is sugar in my coffee, but... <laughs> You know what they say, new year, new me. I'm Aww. going to be the sweetest I can be. Just, so Thank you so much, Serge. Thank you. I'm doing wonderful. I am rested, refreshed, and so excited about what the new year is going to bring us. And really excited about uh, today's episode because we have the guys from the Job Board Geeks. We have joining us today, uh, Jeff Dickey Chasen, who is the job, do job board doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I can spit that out, believe me. <laughs> and uh, also, we have Steve Rothberg, who is the founder of College Recruiter. Gentlemen, welcome once again. Hi there. I, How I many? Think I got a. I think I got a cavity from uh, Serge when he, when he was starting out there. <laughs> right. So. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> I'll take it though. I'll take it. <laughs> How many times have you been on the show, Jeff? I think this is your third time. And obviously you're a new collaborator with your updates, which I really enjoyed. So everyone listening, mm -hmm. if you haven't gone, do go listen to the year end recap of everything that's happened in work tech and job boards in 2021. It's a pretty inform informative um, episode, in my opinion. But welcome, Jeff. Oh, and Steven, your second fun. time. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Well, it's it had to come on twice to try to, you know, apologize for the first. No. Well, we must be pretty desperate for guests, right? We're getting to oh, that stop. point that we're we're just Somebody. rehashing. Try and be sweet, Serge. Jesus, okay, I'm... you lasted all of thirty-five seconds. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Awesome. So, um, recapping 2021 in the job board space. Um, could I start with um, with you, Stephen, and share with me any big surprises of what happened or maybe what didn't happen in 2020? Uh, but what didn't happen is that there was like a, the, a lack of investment didn't happen, if that makes sense. It, it was there was um, 2020 was by far the largest amount of money invested into the space, not just job boards, but all kind of work tech. Um, it blew away every previous year. And 2021 was almost four times that. Is that staggering? Yeah, yeah. The, the numbers in 2021 was around 5 billion, right? And then if we looked at last year, it was 70, almost $18 billion investment in work tech space in general. So pretty incredible. Jeff, I'm going to ask you, do you think it's going to be higher this year? Um, I'd say there's a potential. I mean, I, I've, I've heard other people say, no, you know, we've hit the wall. That's not going to go any higher, but um, there's no reason for it to go lower at this point. You know, there's still a lot of money floating around out there um, and there's consolidation at the top that's going on. There's new players that aren't necessarily visible to us from inside the inside the industry they're trying to move in i mean you know look at what process did by uh, buying stack overflow i mean i think everyone was kind of floored by that they're like where, where the heck these guys come from i can guarantee you there's other companies like that they're going to be coming in they're going to be making acquisitions they're going to be making investments and then you know all these startups you know that keep getting money and keep getting money i mean job and talent just Apparently, every time they cough, someone gives them another hundred million. Um, and so I, th I think it's going to go at the same level or higher in 2022. I just don't see what would hold it back at this point. Wow. So interesting point on that end, because um, there's, there's a couple of factors that are coming into play. Money is going to be more expensive, right? And in, in 2022, with obviously inflation, and we're probably going to see the interest rates go up. But that puts in perspective of what happened last year. There were so many things that happened. And I think the probably the biggest one was Zip Recruiter's IPO or mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. direct listing. What was your thoughts on that? Were you surprised by that, Stephen? Um, I was surprised about Zip Recruiter's IPO only in the sense that it took so long. Um, I think that they, they were wicked smart and they could have done it at least a couple of years earlier, but they really 
um, weren't in a rush. They didn't need to be in a rush. They did it. They did it properly. Uh, some of the IPOs that you see out there are because the there's a real need for that money. That the firms are burning a lot of cash, and unless they're sold or um, you know through some kind of M and A activity or an IPO, they're going to run out of cash. And that wasn't Zip's issue. Um, Zip went IPO so that they could take that next big step. Uh, I, one of the things that I'm thinking is that will likely happen in 2022 to, to build on what Jeff was saying. I agree with everything he said, and I'll just add to it, is I think we're going to see a lot of investment in the industry to fuel global expansion. So Zip raising $500 million through a debt offering on the heels of an IPO, an equity offering, I agree with Chad and Cheese, you don't just raise that, that money for kicks and giggles. Um, they're paying a relatively high interest rate. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a couple of points or a few points above prime. And so it's not like in the 80s where it'd be 18%, it was five something percent. But that's, you don't go and raise $500 million at five something percent just to have some numbers in your bank account. You're going to be using that for something. And that's not to they're not going to be using that just to hire a few people because of hiring a few people doesn't cost that. Mm -hmm. So I think the only logical answer is M and A activity. Mm -hmm. And I could absolutely see zip um, taking that their business model and really building it out in the UK or Australia or someplace like that, someplace where um, boy, posting pricings are $1,200 for 30 days and zip can come in there at 200 bucks and capture 30% of the market in a year. Um, I, I, that, that's what I, that's where I think they're going to use that money for. Well, yeah, Stephen, I've got to jump in on this uh, too, because, um, you talked about the globalization, uh, effect. And one of the things that happened, uh, towards the end of this year is Stepstone started getting ready for an IPO and mm -hmm. Stepstone, you know, for those of you that aren't familiar with them, uh, is a subsidiary of Axel Springer. It's based in Germany. Um, it's very dominant in Germany and Central Europe, but it also has a number of properties in the UK and it's bought a few companies here in the US. And there, you know, I, I would be completely non-surprised to see them IPO, turn around, take the money and buy a major property in the US um, because they've been thinking about doing that for a long time. And so Zip has to, you know, they're, they're not dumb. They're, they're watching what these other companies are doing uh, apart from Indeed, and saying, "Yeah, you know, we we need we needed to IPO so that we could we could continue to expand, but we also need more money for acquisitions like you were talking about." And you know, I think about small technology companies that could be ramped up. You know, we we talked to JobSync. You know, I think they're the perfect example of of the kind of a company that uh, you know a company like um, Zip would would acquire because they could leverage the heck out of that that property. Yeah. So, yeah, it's and, for and everyone. I think one thing that they need more than anything else is is a podcast, right? I mean, that if if <laughs> if either one of these organizations were to, and and I mean, I, I'm hearing rumors that they want to grossly overpay uh, for that, also. Yeah, you know, they all. I'll answer their call any day. We uh, <laughs> we're not adverse to getting bought. So, and just for the audience to know uh, what we're talking here, but as far as uh, Zip Recruiter is, uh, just yesterday, I believe was announced they're they're trying to sell five hundred million in of junk bonds, basically trying to get that liquidity. And it, it, you're completely right. What would they be doing with that money? Is not to hire more people generally. I, and Zip Recruiters basically Achilles heel for the longest amount of time is their presence outside of North America, even outside of the US because Canada's market, they're, they're not even really a competitor at the moment. They're definitely made some uh, gains here, but they have no presence outside. So how do you do that? And how do you look at acquiring? And I think the obvious, like what I'm looking at is talent.com. Uh, talent.com mm -hmm. has done a pretty good job of expanding outside of North America. Uh, they're raising a ton of money, as you were saying. So I think there is a fit. So prediction, first prediction of 2022, Zip Recruiter will buy talent.com. So let's see if that happens or not. Talent.com, a Canadian company as well. So we're seeing a lot of progress in the Canadian job board market. Um, 
if we move on to that and then we look at predictions, which I just gave you my prediction, like give me a bold prediction for 2022, Stephen, that's going to happen in job board world. So you kind of stole my thunder there, Serge. <laughs> <laughs> he does that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll pivot a little bit then, and I, and I, won't, I won't say the same thing that you did, but that was going to be my prediction uh, for, for the record. But um, uh, Sure, I could, sure. I, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I, could, I, could see, um, I could see a step stone, um, like Jeff says, once, once they've gone public and they have that infusion of capital, they've always been well-funded, um, but having IPO money behind them is kind of different than going to private equity or going to original shareholders. And I, something that's really been on Stepstone's list for a long time is to buy a large, somewhat dominant job board in the North American market. And, um, and then I could see them taking that dominant job board and then building out from there. Uh, one of the key issues in any kind of acquisition is talent, not the talent that your job board sends to the customer, but who is actually running that job board. And yeah. because as smart and savvy as those folks are in Germany and Poland and South Africa and other places where they have job boards, they don't understand the North American job board market as well as people who are in North America. And they bought AppCast, what, four years ago? Mm -hmm. But yep. AppCast isn't a job board. And so there, that's not the acquisition that you then turn around and build out a job board business with. It's, mm -hmm. it's the more that I look at AppCast, the more I think I, that, that, that a large part of that acquisition was actually about keeping it out of the hands of Indeed. And um, so do they buy Telru? Do they buy Talent? Um, if I was one of those organizations right now, I would be probably... Uh, having a lot of phone calls with my investment bankers and learning about the auction, um, the bidding going up between those organizations. <laughs> well, we have Tad uh, from Telru coming on the show later this month. So I'm going to ask him that question specifically. And I'm going to say it's coming from you, Stephen, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he, I'm sure if he heard that I said that, I'm sure that any uh, confidentiality agreements that he may have entered into, he would just completely disregard because because that's just that's just how much weight um, I would have uh, in, in that discussion. Yeah, weight. perfect. Yeah, perfect. Weight that's weight. great. Jeff, what's your thoughts? <laughs> Big bold predictions and don't uh, steal mine like uh, Stephen, please. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not the kind of person that Stephen is in that regard. Um <laughs> I, you know, I'm kind of with Tim Sackett. The big news for me last year was when Career Builder got a new logo. Um, mm. I thought that was incredibly exciting and it kind of shook the core of the industry. And so my prediction for this year is that indeed we'll get a new logo that's <gasps> actually doesn't look like a ripoff of the Amazon logo. That's that's my that's my hope. That's my belief. Um, so. But, uh, you can't see her face, audience. This is sarcasm. Like, let's just make that clear. And, yeah. And yeah. the Amazon logo is a ripoff of the Nike logo. And the it's Nike the logo is, The Nike logo is a ripoff of the High V logo coming out of Iowa. So, oh, the grocery store that? company? Yep. The grocery store. Yeah. Wow, well, I it's... thought that the only grocery stores in Iowa were Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> I. We don't have piggly, piggly wigglies here in Canada, so I I never. Thing? Yeah, is I, I, it is name, a real yeah. thing. I I've actually heard of it before. No, that's. I thought that was something from Looney Tune cartoons or something. It could no, be. No. It's well, let's let's place. talk about recruit. Let's it talk is. about recruit. So recruit is the dominant player in this space. Will be going into the next two, three, four, five years. Um, but they must start feeling, they are probably starting to feel some pressure, right? Uh, ZipRecruiters is making some roads in North America. Um, they acquired Glassdoor, and Glassdoor already, in my opinion, seems to be a relic. I, Glassdoor will die mm. 
in uh, in our lifetime but in the five to ten years i i can't see glassdoor survive um just a generation that is coming up and i think there's a a lot of interesting point that actually joel cheeseman was talking about as far as people going on TikTok and giving their reviews there and and quitting on the spot as well i think that's where it's going as far as video and how uh, Generation Z is is approaching it. I don't think they're going to go to Glassdoor and type in uh, this place is a shitty place to work. I don't think they want, really want to get invested in that. So what is going to happen to recruit? They've had massive growth in the last year, which if you build it upon the numbers they had, um, they obviously have a machine rolling. Do you see that machine keep rolling, uh, Stephen? I, um, I, I do see it rolling, but I see it I think a little bit differently than you do. I I don't think that the folks at Recruit or their properties like Indeed look at other job boards as their closest competitors. Yeah. I think they look at other staffing companies as their closest competitors. Yep. Recruit is a it's a Japanese holding company. The bulk of their revenues come from some staffing. So these guys know staffing, unlike some job boards who think that they know what staffing is all about and actually don't, or staffing companies like Ronstadt that buy a job board and then discover that it's not quite the same business. Um, you know, it's like the difference of owning a high-end steak restaurant versus a burger flipping, you know, um, um, like hot dog stand kind of, play, you know, um, truck or something. It's at the end of the day, you're providing food to people, but the way that you provide it and how you price it and how you market it, very, very different. Um, staffing companies and job boards are quite different. I would, if I was somebody at Indeed or Recruit, I would be um, focused far more on competing against the RPOs at competing against the, the big staffing companies and potentially acquiring those the Indeed brand, the model, their execution, amazing. Yeah. Um, but they are, but they are rapidly moving away from anything that would be tra a traditional job board product, like a post and pray duration based posting. That's like so far in their rear view mirror, they can hardly even see it. So, you know, just tying back to what we were talking about a moment ago from you know, the European players potentially looking at entering into the North American market. Um, could you comment on what you think the uh, recruit holdings and the Japanese did right in, um, in, in coming into the North American market? Because they did, I don't know if it was a matter of patience and um, just to stay, just always holding steady with their vision and just being super patient um, but what do you think the other um, companies that are looking at job boards and trying to enter into the North American market, what page out of Recruit Holdings book should they be taking? Um, the, the patience of Recruit, I think, is a reflection of their Japanese heritage, that they don't look at performance on a quarterly basis or even an annual basis. They're looking 10, 20 years out. Mm -hmm. And way back when indeed was just getting started one of the smartest things that they did was to define their customer as basically anybody who would want to buy traffic from them and so you had job boards who were far more sophisticated and far more likely to spend money on buying traffic mm -hmm. being indeed's, indeed's big customers and then indeed slowly started to move away from the job boards and for providing them free traffic. And then they started to do the same thing with staffing companies. And now they're even doing the same thing with employers. These guys are in it for the long haul. And it's one of the reasons when I look at a stepstone that I'm super bullish on a stepstone hmm. because the Germans have the same sort of, you know what, if this year isn't all that good, that's fine because we care a lot more about where we're gonna be five or 10 or 20 years from now than we do about in Q1 of 2022. Um, and, you know, the Americans and to some extent, Canadians, not quite as, as, as much. I grew up in Winnipeg, so I've got a little bit of a handle on that. Um, we don't the, claim you, by the way, so you can't well, say you're Canadian. I was, I, you know, like Celine Dion and Justin Bieber, I'm, I'm not allowed back in. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, we look at stuff far, far too short term. True. And it leads us into a lot of bad decision making. Agreed. 
So, and Stephen, I was going to say that you know one of the one of the other companies that we haven't talked about, which I think share similarities with Recruit and Stepstone, is Seek. You know, mm. they they are literally the only um, company that I know of that's fought indeed on its home turf and successfully beat them. You know, pushed them out of the market for all intents and purposes. Um, Seek has that sort of same long-term philosophy. They've, they've actually got their own, you know, fund that sits there and invests in other recruitment technologies and other recruitment companies. Uh, you know, they own, uh, shares in job street, they own shares in, uh, uh, I can't pronounce the name, but it's one of China, uh, China's largest job boards. Um, you know, they've, they've got, and they've got, They've got fingers in South America. They've got properties in uh, in Southeast Asia. They're all over the world, and they really fly under the handle uh, uh, under the radar. But the thing about them is, they have that long term view. They're sort of saying, okay, you know, we're investing in all these different places, and we're doing it, uh, you know, to get a foothold, to expand recruitment, and we're willing to try anything. You know, they invest in all sorts of different things. Um, and I agree with you, you know, in the U S that mentality doesn't really exist. It's kind of sad, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a product of the stock market. You know, I, I worked for several companies that became public and I remember the corrosive effect that going public had on dice. Mm -hmm. And I certainly yeah. saw the corrosive effect that it had on monster. Um, it's kind of sad to say, because of course, a lot of people make money, but from a company perspective, it's not always the best thing in the world to IPO. So, mm -hmm. well, I think so the perfect Jeff, Jeff. Does that mean that the Job Board Geek podcast IPO is off? Does that, does that mean that we're not <laughs> going to be in it for the long haul? Three hundred episodes. Yeah, exactly. Right. Three hundred episodes. So, well, let's talk about that. Thinking about short term and long term thinking. Let's talk about Facebook Jobs. Uh, Facebook Jobs announced last week that they were shutting down basically everywhere outside of North America. And my first reaction was like, shut it down in Canada and the U.S. as well because it's a piece of shit. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> what's your thought? Really yeah, yeah, Jeff, what's your thoughts there? Your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, you know, I I feel like I've looked at Facebook trying to crack the recruitment nut for almost the whole time I've been consulting and I've been in this gig for 13 years, you know, and, and I just feel like the one, I don't think they're serious about it in, in sort of a top level corporate, this is one of the three pillars of our business kind of thing. Um, two, I don't think they bring in the right people that actually understand recruiting because you have to have people um, like we were saying earlier, you have to have people in an organization that really understand how companies recruit people uh, at, at different levels, you know, little companies, mid-sized, mid large companies. And then finally, you have to be willing to be persistent over the long haul, you know, and they failed on all three levels, you know, and, and every few years they come back and say, okay, this time we're going to do it. And then it sort of fizzles along and, okay, we're going to do it again. And so I, I'm with you, Serge. I think they should shut down in the U S and Canada because you know, they're, they're Facebook. They're already focused on the metaverse. You know, who knows what Zuckerberg's really thinking about doing, but it's not going to be recruitment. So it's 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 a waste of their shareholders' money if they stay in the market, in my opinion. I agree. Yes. The execution was probably the worst that I've ever seen because being a practitioner and having Facebook jobs installed into my ATS and getting applicants coming from it, it was 90% of the candidates were clicking on apply now, but not realizing that they don't have any information in their work section of Facebook. So you're getting a hundred resume or hundred applications with a name and a job they had uh, 14 years ago when they signed up on Facebook and they put their first job there and nothing updated. It was, and not realizing this, like candidates mm -hmm. were not realizing this. And I hiring managers was like, what are these people doing? They like, I never want to talk to them. They're applying the wrong way. I'm like, it's, it's, it's not their fault. In reality, it's, it's how Facebook jobs set it up. So what's your thoughts, Steven? Are you a big fan of Facebook jobs or? Well, I think, I think the two of you are just bitter because not enough people like your posts on Facebook. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what you need to do is go to a beach and show your bare legs and painted toenails and you'll get lots of likes. And, <laughs> So, uh, um, oh, I've tried that, Stephen, on OnlyFans, and uh, did not get a good response. <laughs> it didn't take off. 
<laughs> well, at least you won't have a tax issue this year. Um, the, you know, yeah, you know, I think one of the things that that Facebook struggles with with the job market reminds me of is some of the things that at a much, much smaller scale that we've struggled with at College Recruiter. And, and that is we will have customers that are tempting to us to, to go after, to land their business, to sell to them, to renew to them. And at the end of the day, what we need to do to properly serve those accounts is really different from what we need to do to serve our other accounts. So we have our ideal customers and then you have these occasional ones that come along and they want to write you a big check, but in order to, for you to deliver the service that they're buying, you have to substantially deviate from uh, the, the, the process that you already have or offer them a really different product. And jobs, because of all of the uh, non-discrimination laws, are very much like that. So if you want to market um, you know, shortening on, on Facebook, you know, put an ad up for people people to buy shortening, you can absolutely target, you know, women between the ages of 50 and 65 who live in these areas and have these different likes. But if you want to do that with jobs, no way. If you want to do with the housing, no way. And that deviation from their standard process, I don't think enough has been talked about in that context. It's like, if I was at Facebook, it's like, is it worth it? Is it worth it for us to build out this whole new process and to try to put in safeguards to ensure that if, if Serge wants to post a job, that he doesn't somehow get it into the system in a way that appears to be discriminatory and maybe even is discriminatory and therefore harms Facebook's brand? At the end of the day, how much money are we going to make off of Serge's job posting versus the shortening ads? That, that, that we're selling. And I just think it's just that the juice isn't worth the squeeze to Facebook. <laughs> so, Very catchy. Very catchy. Yeah. <laughs> to coin that. Oh my God. So, so I, can we also just talk a little bit about um, Google for jobs? Because I feel and said right from the start, I know I got pummeled by um, Chad and Cheese and Surge for say, how dare I say that Google for jobs isn't gonna work uh, for the exact same reason Facebook wouldn't. They don't understand employment, mm. but because Google is so big and they are they own everything. And the argument was always, well, you know, they know search, they understand search. What they don't understand though, is how companies hire. Um, and I said that from the beginning and everybody was like, oh, patting me on the head and saying, well, Shelly just doesn't understand. So can somebody please chime in here about where are we at now that uh, Google for jobs came out in October and uh, what's uh, anybody in uh, Shelly, I just have to jump in because I was one of those people that said you were wrong. Uh, I think the first time I came on, um, you're still wrong um, <laughs> for some different reasons. Uh so let, let me put it this way. Um, Google, what, Google for Jobs is not trying to do the same thing that Facebook for, uh, for Jobs was doing. Facebook mm -hmm. for Jobs is essentially trying to be a job board. Google mm -hmm. for Jobs is essentially trying to, to improve their traffic so they can monetize their traffic by improving the results that their candidates get when they look for stuff, which I think was a really smart approach. I'm not, I'm not sure how long it took for them to work to get to that end, but you know, from the job board side of the fence, most of my clients have seen a reasonable amount of traffic come through from Google for jobs. You know, when they format their jobs to match the schema, they get a lift and it's a, it's an indeed killer for those guys. You know, they're typically niche job boards that I work with. Mm -hmm. um, from the candidate experience, uh, you know, I've heard this over and over again, because I sit and talk to college students all the time about looking for work. And they say, yeah, you know, I really like it. It's, it's easy. It makes sense. I get good results, blah, 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 blah. And the, and the other part of this that we don't see, but I think Stephen can speak to, is that there are job boards out there using the Google, essentially the Google search um, mm -hmm. tool that they have. 
uh, that they, they license out that job boards can use that they get better results and they get um, better response in terms of, you know, when candidates search on their site or when they look for stuff, they get stuff that matches what they want. There's a higher apply rate. There's a higher satisfaction rate. The employers are happier. So I think it's totally different. I think Google's goals were totally different than Facebook's goals. And, you know, I'm sorry to say you're wrong, but you know. <laughs> okay. No, that's okay. So thank you. That's all right. Um, I, I'm, not so, seeing, I, I'm not seeing it. So tell me what you're so, saying. So Serge has told Shelly that she's wrong. And Jeff has told Shelly that she's wrong. And Chad Soash and Joel Cheeseman. <clears throat> what do all four of these people have in common? Um, there's a whole lot of mansplaining going on here, I think. <laughs> oh, 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 give me a break, Steven. <laughs> hey, I can, I can pander. I can pander like the best of them. I was the, just thinking Canadian the whole time. I wasn't thinking oh. male, female. So, I'm, you know, I, I, I am as sweet as maple syrup. Um, but the, uh, another aspect that, that the Google for jobs has had a substantial impact on that again i think coming from as a as an owner of a job board i can probably see this better than those who are customers of ours whether those would be job seekers or those would be employers and that is when google for jobs when google announced that it was rolling out google for jobs a big stated goal was to make job content easier for people to find to access to search they didn't say that that searching had to be on Google. What they were, but part of what they were trying to do was improve the quality of the content across the internet. And it has had a substantial impact. Other than indeed, I don't know of any job board anywhere that has just ignored Google for jobs. Virtually every job board has changed the way that they code their site, the pages that the job postings appear on, to make those jobs easier for Google to read. What's the job title? What's the starting, uh, the, the, the low and high range of the salary? What's the company name? And you, you tag all of those. You basically identify, tell Google, this field represents the company name. This field represents the job title. This is the job description. This is, these are the job requirements. And if there are 100,000 job boards worldwide, there used to be 100,000 ways of presenting that information. And it was super cumbersome for Google to then figure out what's the job title, what's the company name, et cetera. And remember, nobody's looking at this. It all has to be automated. It has to be perfect every time. And it has to be at scale. And now what you see is that virtually every job board is using that schema is, is what yeah. Google calls it. And whether that's Google then providing you that information or whether that's Bing or whoever, it all, has wor it all works easier. It is a lot easier to go and find a job online now than it was when Google for Jobs was rolling out. And I think we, we owe Google a thanks for that. And also the job job board software companies. You know, there's there's forty or fifty uh, software companies around the world that power a lot of the smaller job boards. Some some of the larger mm -hmm. ones, and all of those are now Google compliant. And that has a sort of a logarithmic effect in terms of, you know, all of these thousands and thousands of job boards that they are that they power are as Stephen was saying, they're now using the Google schema. And and he's right. And the ATS. You know? And the yeah, ATS, and ATS too, right? right. Yeah. yeah, a lot of ATS. So Shelly, remember when we were talking about this initially and you were really hardcore telling me that I was wrong and what I was saying and I'm like, I'm going to mansplain and say I'm right <laughs> is Google okay. for jobs is okay, going give, to improve the candidate experience across the world, <laughs> even if they never monetize anything they do. And that is happening. Maybe not as quick as we initially thought or wanted, but it is happening. But guys, I want to jump in. We have a lot of practitioners that listen to this podcast. And there is so much noise when it comes to job boards, different HR tech. And it gets confusing of where they should be spending their money. And unfortunately, a lot of companies don't really know where they're getting results, where they should go. They automatically think of Indeed. They automatically think of ZipRecruiter. 
But if you were leading, a, say, a talent acquisition function, how would you look as far as allocation your budget between the big job boards, niche, uh, targeted job boards? How would you approach that? Jeff, I'll, I'll let you take that one first. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the type, where you go in terms of trying to, to promote your job opportunities or to try to find candidates, is a function of a couple of things. One is um, the types of jobs you have, and that can be a function of, you know, the type mm -hmm. of company. Are you a company that employs 80% software developers? Or are you sort of a company that has a mix of a bunch of different types of positions at different levels? Uh, the second part is size, which is going to drive the frequency of hire. And then um, the third part is um, to less, greater or lesser degree location and the prevalence or non-prevalence of remote work. So you put those three things together and that <clears throat> to me is gonna drive what my recommendation would be. So if you're a company that has a very sort of monoculture type of job that you're filling uh, and it tends to be you know, high volume and it tends to be widely spread, then you know, you're, you're probably should be spending your money on programmatic would be my guess. Um, mm. And you might consider spending money with Indeed um, or you might cons consider spending money with one of the aggregators. If you're a company that's um, got highly skilled jobs and they and they have maybe a lower rate of need, but um, you're you you're growing so that your need continue is continuous. Um, I would say you know look at a niche site because a niche site is going to have you're going to get more bang for your buck. I mean if you're hiring for uh, people that work in uh, public utilities, uh, you know, if you if you go with a job board that focuses on public utility experts, that's it's just going to be better for you uh, than trying to use something like Indeed, which is very broad based. And you know, if you're a little tiny company and you're just hiring one one offs here and there, um, you know, I mean, this may sound like heresy, but um, if they're non remote jobs, you know, look at local media. Um, mm -hmm. and, and look at things like Craigslist and look at some of the, you know, the, uh, horizontals like the OLXs of the world. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of options, but I think it always comes back for me on the employer side to frequency and focus. And, uh, and again, you know, is this a job that has to be in my region? You, all jobs used to have to be in the geography of the hirer. And that's not the case anymore, but it's still a, it's still a factor for probably 60, 70 percent of employers. So. Thanks, and I would, Jeff. I would, and I, I would say if, if you're what we're, what we're talking about here is how to market your job opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about how to market your job opportunities and you're a practitioner, perhaps a HR generalist, the likelihood of you having a significant amount of marketing expertise is pretty low. You have some, but not as much as the marketing director in, in your organization or the advertising agency that helps you sell toothpaste. Um, lean on those people and ask them, what do they do when they're marketing your organization's products or services? And invariably what you're gonna hear is test, measure, test, measure, test, measure. The measure piece is something that I think a lot of advertisers on the TA side um, don't really have a good handle on. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And different organizations can and should measure differently. So for some organizations, especially a small one, it's pretty easy to know where your applicants are coming from and therefore your hires. And at the end of the day, you need to hire somebody to deliver your pizzas. That's what really matters. But if you're trying to hire a thousand people, you're not going to put all, you know, one ad on Facebook jobs or Craigslist or Indeed or College Recruiter or Jobilico or, or any other organ. You know, you're going to spread that around and you're going to need to get applicants coming from a variety of sources. What I hate to hear is when an employer says that the way that we're going to measure the effectiveness of the job board is on the cost per hire. Because the cost per hire is only a valid metric for the hiring manager. It's not even a valid metric for the recruiter. The recruiter does not hire anyone. The recruiter presents a short slate and the hiring manager chooses 
who they hire. And if that hiring manager wants to hire her niece, who wasn't in the recruiter's list of three recommended candidates, that doesn't mean that the recruiter failed to do her job. She did her job by presenting three well-qualified candidates to the hiring manager. Um, so the recruiter shouldn't be measured on a cost per hire basis. And if the recruiter's not measured on that, then for God's sakes, their tool, the job board, shouldn't be either. So the currency that job boards are typically measured by is the effective cost per application. If you spend $100 on a posting and you're a retailer, you should probably be getting four or five applications from that, somewhere in the $20 to $30 range. And if your job board is delivering applications at that dollar number, then that job board is doing its job. And that, you know, you then need to convert those applicants into hires. But that's that's not on the job board. That's on the recruiter and to a much larger extent to, on the hiring manager. And I think one of the things, I mean, you guys know this better than me, is um, the, the other aspect of this, apart from uh, the, the number of applications that you get, is the so-called quality of applicants, mm. right? And that, you know, I found when talking to employers and in the past hiring a lot of people, uh, describing what a quality applicant is can be very challenging. And I think a lot of organizations jump into trying to market their opportunities, trying to find applicants without ever actually saying, how would we know if Serge was someone that we really, really, really want to hire? Does he say bad words on a routine basis? If, if so, is that the definition of a bad quality applicant or is that the definition of someone we'd like to work with? You know, so. Well, I think I think we can all agree that if the candidate pronounces it Z instead of Z, <laughs> that you know that they are of a much higher quality. So, you know, I really appreciate that point, Jeff, because uh, at the end of the day, I think there's been over the years, an addiction to, I need hundreds of people to choose from, mm -hmm. or I just need to see five more candidates like this one, which is insane. You know, I know recruiters, you know, if, if there are uh, one reason why people just decided to get out of the business, it was the hiring manager that keeps going back and saying, well, I just need to see a few more um, of this quality applicant. I I absolutely love that thinking. It's, it's, I don't need, you're only trying to fill one job. Mm -hmm. Or if you're trying to fill mm -hmm. thousands, that is a, that's a different conversation. But the quality of applicants um, and being able to connect that to source. It's, it sounds simple, but you know, unless you've got a, at least a half decent applicant tracking system that can tell you that, or as a recruiter, we should know, like, where can we, where do these people hang out, right? If mm -hmm. we're recruiting in this space or in this category, we really should know um, where to find these. Now, so my, my question though would be, sometimes it's harder to find out what the niche job boards are. Right. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of the ironic part of this is, yep. you know, I'd love to find uh, what is the niche job board for business development people in Texas. Mm -hmm. I can't find it. I don't know how to find it. Anything that you can give for tips for talent acquisition people to, how do we find these niche job boards? Because programmatic is a long way away from most, um, mo certainly most here in Canada. And I think even in the US. Well, I, so there's, there's, there's a couple of tools out there that are useful for discovering boards that you've never heard of. Uh, there's a site called Job Board Finder. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's jobboardfinder.net. And while they certainly aren't exhaustive, they, they have over a thousand job boards and they're primarily niche sites and it's multinational. Uh, so it's kind of, it's a useful way to sort of acquaint yourself. Another way to discover these sites is by using the Google for jobs search. Um, because, mm -hmm. because as Steven said, you know, all the niche sites are indexing themselves for this. If you go in and you start searching for these jobs in particular locations, you know, they're typically going to come up with, you know, 50, 100, 200 uh, jobs that are listed. And you're going to see, you know, you can apply for this through LinkedIn or you can apply for it through, um, you know, lawncarejobs.com, you know. And, and so that, that, that's one of the big side benefits, actually, of Google for jobs for niche sites is the greater exposure apart from the traffic. And then I think finally, um, this is something I learned when I was working uh, with a company that focused on software developers. Um, 
I went and talked to the, to the people that are involved. And I say like, you know, where do you go? Where do you look for jobs? Mm -hmm. Who who do you talk to? How, how do you, how do you find this stuff? And invariably, uh, particularly when you get into technical stuff, they come up with some really wild things. And I've discovered a number of uh, insanely niche job boards that way. So um, I, I think that's good advice in general for hiring managers. Yeah, pretending that you're the candidate that you're searching for is just put, you know, if you if you can sort of envision the, the what a marketer would call it is the persona. Mm -hmm. This is this is what that person looks like. Yeah. And I don't mean just physically, but more importantly, that how they find information. If you're a software developer, <clears throat> you are going to find information really, really differently then if you're somebody who has a moped and you're looking to deliver, you know, tacos um, for a few hours a day, you know, the, the, the moped person, they're local. They're going to be in your neighborhood. Like go and print up a bunch of flyers at your local mm -hmm. UPS store and drop it in the mailboxes for, you know, four block radius. And, and, you know, you're probably hired those three people in the next couple of days. You don't, you don't have to go and find like delivery drivers in, south broadmoor texas you know or what it's it, it, there are other ways of hiring people other than posting jobs to job boards as a job board owner i'm just i can't believe i just said that That's really <laughs> yeah i can't believe you said that at all so guys <laughs> incredible information it seems like you guys know something about the job board world a little bit um because hard, of that you say. yeah it's, it's <laughs> Because of that, you actually started a podcast called Job Board Geeks, which you're now on the seventh episode. How's it going, guys? Is it is podcasting everything you thought it would be plus more, or is it just a giant pain in the ass it's, and you're like, why the hell did we do this? It's it's going way better for me than it is for Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what I was drinking when I said, oh, yeah, Stephen. That sounds great. Let's let you you come come on as a co-host. Um, I it was a bad thing. I don't know. I think I ate the worm at the bottle of the tequila bottle or something. I, I was gonna say I think that there was salt <laughs> and a lime involved and yeah, little yeah. glasses filled with clear liquid. <laughs> Yeah, it, no, exactly no, the same thing that happened with me and Shelly is like I don't know what I was drinking when I I proposed. Oh, that. oh, oh come yeah. On. Oh, there there yeah. goes my resolution. I've already screwed it up, Shelly. <laughs> it was the okay. best thing that ever happened to me was having Shelly come on the podcast. Sorry, Shelly, that's what I, I would meant. agree with that. Yeah, it's been oh. fun, <laughs> honest to God. Yeah, if if it's, uh, I wish you all the best because I know you have so much to give back to the community. Um, talent acquisition people, I think we're starved for this. I'm so glad you started Job Board Geeks because it is this sort of help me understand what's happening, help me improve. Um, and that really goes to the heart of, of why we continue our, our podcast as well, is just knowing if one person can take one nugget of information from your, mm -hmm. from your show or your episode and become that much better. Because I think well, what we do is is help people provide better for their families, one better job at a time, right? Yeah. Well, uh, and you were so talking there's... about discovery of, of niche boards. Actually, for your audience, uh, Job Board Geek is probably a good show to listen to because we're talking to people that run job boards that are very, you know, very different. They have very different approaches. They're in different niches. And, um, you know, you may stumble upon one that would be perfect uh, for one of your clients. So where can people find it? It's on all available on all podcasts, um, catchers yeah. uh, across them. Yeah. yeah, it's it's on it's on Apple and Spotify and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If you want to just take a quick look at what we've done so far, you can go to jobboarddoctor.com slash podcast, and there's a, a player insert in there that just lets you look listen to anything that's in our in our repertoire at this point. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that has been really nice and I, I, I fully credit Jeff for having the vision for the podcast and, you know, what, what would be the content, what, what would be the audience. And, and then I kind of tagged along to, towards the end of that is that we're really focused on bringing to the listeners um, the job board that they may not have heard of. They may be a job board from the UK. It may be a job board that is, uh, we did an episode recently of a, of a job board that's basically sales marketing some IT in Boston. 
So I mean, if you, you know, for the folks in, in Calgary, right, that job board's pretty irrelevant. But when you listen to how they approach their business, you can't help but pick up some really infer, in, interesting tips mm-hmm. about how they market to the candidates, what the candidates are looking for. And then like we talk about in recruiting transferable skills, Mm -hmm. the information that a recruiter hears from a job board operator can translate into something that that recruiter can then use when they're marketing their jobs to their candidates. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I'll be, I'll be subscribing. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Always wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining us once again. And as always, reserving the right to call you, have you come back on again. Well, thanks for inviting us. Uh, It's been fun, even with Serge. Oh, Jeff, like (laughs) you're supposed to be nicer too, right? Oh, oh, oh. What's what's going on here? So do check out Job Board Geeks, Stephen, Jeff, pleasure love having you on. So everyone have a great weekend or week. Thank you.